St. Paul said that in all things he, Christ, should have the preeminence. Many people have a place for Christ, and some have a prominent place, but that's always insufficient to who the Lord is, and he should have the preeminence. And if you'll give witness to that and bring happiness to the Father, who loves for you to talk about his Son, say amen. Amen. One of the great challenges of teaching and preaching is that you realize that many times you say things that don't relate to people. You may have an idea from the Scripture, or God may impress you with a passage or a book of the Bible that you want to teach, but it has... uh, various uh, touch points and different uh, impact on the listener. And the art of uh, good preaching is to find out the need, try to meet it with the adequate biblical teaching, and uh, hope above all hopes that you have been an honor to the Lord Jesus. The subject this morning uh, is not uh, uh, without effectiveness. In fact, everyone in this room this morning will feel the impact of the subject or theme of the morning, which is forgiveness. Of the 75 words of the Lord's Prayer, the heart of that prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive others who have debts against us, is the only part of the prayer and the only prayer Jesus told us to say that uh, bears responsibility to us. The Our Father, hallowed be thy name, That's praise that we give to God. And even at the end, thine is the kingdom and the power for glory forever and ever. That again attributes all things to God for his praise and glory. Uh, Now in the center of the passage, the Lord's Prayer, we have this phrase, which has a personal responsibility and uh, a request of God that if he would forgive our debts, we would also do what he did for us and forgive others. The word debt is one of the meanings of the word forgive. It means to cancel a debt, an obligation. And in the biblical sense, when God forgives our sins, our obligations to him and to fellow man, it is a price that we could not pay. So the hymn says, there is no other good enough to pay the price of sin, he only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. So God is the only self-behavior, and all the things that we experience in life that are called sins, he alone can forgive. The word appears about 600 times in the Bible. It means to cancel a debt, it means to lift off, and it means to take away. We sing that the Lord takes away our sins. And the Bible has marvelous instructions at almost every point in the Scripture, either by the illustration of people or by the application of a word, uh, that God is the only forgiver. But we are held responsible to forgive others. Now, it's the only message uh, anywhere in all of literature. Uh, Any culture that has the presence of Judaism because they have a day of atonement at one minute with God. And Christianity is this message accepted, taught, or even known. There is no forgiveness in Islam. There is no forgiveness in Buddhism or Taoism or Shintoism or any of these other religions, because forgiveness is an obligation that is beyond the capacity of human people to resolve. The things that exacerbate and annoy us in our culture is that many times the most heinous, difficult, wicked, unbelievable events that take place in a person's life by the abuse of someone else seem to have no retribution, no revenge, no payment is ever satisfied. And we often say, well, justice wasn't satisfied. We'll deal with that in a couple of minutes. But forgiveness is what you feel. When we speak about redemption, that's a theological term, which means to buy back or take away the responsibility of something by the payment of someone else, that's a theological term. And we think that. You think theology. But you feel forgiveness. 
And everyone in this room has felt it. Some of you need to feel it. And some of you need to give it forgiveness to somebody else. Some of you have a hurt that can never be really forgiven or taken away. The person died or uh, the person is recalcitrant. He does not want to apologize. We'll talk about that in a minute. But everybody experiences being offended. Let's put it that way. And hopefully many of us would then feel forgiveness, but many times we don't, and you carry a heartache uh, to the grave. I want to bring you some insight into the word forgiveness from the Scripture. And before we do that, I would like to, uh, would you put up, please, the list uh, that uh, I created this summer of my own thinking? I've never preached this before, so these are all original thoughts, and they may or may not fit you. But what makes difficult for me, what makes a problem for me in forgiveness are these things. These come out of my life. First of all, it seems to excuse the offender. Uh, He gets away or she gets away with it. She doesn't or he doesn't feel the hurt. That's your problem. You have to deal with it. And there is no payback. There's no act of uh, compensation for what I've experienced because I've been offended. Or secondly, the offender doesn't apologize. That's probably the hardest thing that I've had to experience in my life. Not many times, but a few times. But I've heard it over and over in counseling, having my own church for 23 years that grew from 125 people to thousands. So a, 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 a plethora, a wide variety of people through those years that I've met and were in our fellowship and came for counseling. This is probably the biggest problem. The person doesn't recognize it, has some lame excuse, and uh, so the apology isn't forthcoming, and the person is stuck with the apple uh, in the center of his throat. Or the hurt doesn't go away. Why can't I forget it? I should be able to get over it, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Does hurt have anything to do with forgiveness? Is it possible to forgive somebody but still hurt? We'll talk about that. If I forgive, I can't forget. Now, the Bible says God forgives and forgets, but you've got to remember when it says he forgets, he forgets the fact that you sinned, and he's not going to hold that against you. He can't forget anything. It means that because of his love and sacrifice, he's done away and lifted off and canceled your debt, so he can't bring it up any, any uh, more. He can't, uh, at the last minute... Uh, kind of abrogate his responsibility or change his mind. The Bible says of God in him is no shadow of turning. God cannot deny himself. He can't take back his word, and he can't lie. I thought I was going to be able to do that, but I changed my mind. I'm giving up. He can't do that. Well, the point is, I can't forget. And it leaves a scar in my life and in my memory. It's burned in the back of my brain. And when things get difficult or maybe... Uh, If you dream like I do in the middle of the night, you have a dream about something that happened years ago. And it, again, it's like heartburn, like like stomach upset. It just touches you and you feel it again. What's the relationship between feeling and forgiveness? How do I know it won't happen again? That's a real question. Uh, He keeps hurting me. A man in the second service said, I'm being sued by another Christian and I'm I'm paying lawyers, and I'm going to run out of money. What am I going to do about that? How can I forgive him? He won't honor whatever. So this arbitration goes on all the time. It's good for the lawyers and bad for you. But uh, is it going to happen again? And if it happens again, what do I do? And last of all, nothing will ever be the same. No, it won't. And how are you going to deal with that? How do you think we're going to do that in 20 minutes? It's not going to be very easy, is it? (laughs) Uh, We have a book in the back. Franklin Graham wrote it, and there's a whole section on forgiveness in there. You may want to take that as a resource, and that'll be helpful. Also, if you made a decision a Sunday or two ago, 50 or more did, about recovering joy and being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, Billy Graham uh, sent us 50 copies, and then we realized we didn't have enough, so he sent another 50 free to the church that will be available in about a week or so. But if you made that decision public, Please take this book. This is free. This one, there's a little bit of payment uh, for Franklin Graham and Company, okay? 
Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The key verse that will ride with us throughout this service is this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 8. Verse 12. But when you sin so against the brethren, that would be other believers, or an individual believer, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. If I offend you and poke you in the eye, I've, and it's a, it's a descriptive phrase, I have injured and hurt Jesus. That is a very serious passage. And we forget that when you deal with another Christian, you're dealing with a brother or a sister. Husbands, you should all begin to remember that when you hurt your wife, you hurt a member of the body of Christ. She's your sister in Christ. And male and female are the same in God's sight. So you just hurt one of Christ's people. We think we can get away with injuries in our own family. You can't. You should treat your wife as an equal believer, washed by the blood of Christ. You should teach her the tenderness of your love. You should show her a demonstration of your forgiveness and grace. Treat your wife like Jesus' daughter. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that all sin is against God. But sin is also against God's child. So there's a vertical and horizontal consequence to every decision. Do you remember when Joseph had his boss's wife, his name was Potiphar, expose herself in the presence of Joseph, who was the landlord of his estate? And Joseph said to Potiphar's wife while he was away on business, how could I do this thing and sin against God? I would be sinning against my boss. And then you remember she lied and said he did lay with her. And he spent years and years and years in prison. Talk about forgiveness. So we sin against God. And remember, the Bible says the vengeance that is to be distributed to people comes from God. Vengeance is my prerogative, says the Lord. Vengeance is a noun. Revenge is a verb. And they both mean the same thing. And what you and I want to do is you, you want to get revengeous. You, you want to get even. You want to square it up. In fact, you hope he hurts more than you. Nobody wants to say amen to that. I'll say amen to that. <laughs> I've thought that many times. So you have to leave the arbitration. The distribution of the punishment of the bench to God. And the judge of all the earth will do right. He does not miss a thing. And the Bible says, even the thoughts and the intent of what I just said, when I thought about that and felt you were a little naive about what I was saying, and then I confessed it, that intent, what I was thinking at that point, God will hold me accountable. That's why the Bible says, don't desire to be a teacher. You're going to be doubly judged being a teacher than a listener. This is serious. So God will take care of it. Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. Peter says, cast all your care upon him. He cares for you. He'll take up your cause. He knows the wounds that take place. He charts them all, and the Bible says in the last day, God will open books. All the books, Ross Rhodes, the whole thing about Ross's life is recorded. Now, thank God I won't be at that occasion, because my name is written in the what? Tell me, the Lamb's Book of Life. My page is clean because of Jesus. He washed my sins away by his blood. But the point is, God does not miss a beat. And if you want to deal with that and feel that the offender is going to get away with it, just take it easy. 
Just rest. God will deal with it. And really, you shouldn't leave all the punitive action to God. Now, if it's something that needs to be litigated, you go to court. Try not to go to court with another Christian. But if they're nailing you to the cross, you make sure the nails don't go in that deep and you come down and, and give them what if. Because many times Christian will hide behind the fact, well, we shouldn't go to uh, court and let other people decide, well, listen, I've had to tell hundreds of women, if he's beating you, you call the police. And the next time he slaps you, you call me because the chief of police is my friend. You get the policeman in there. You need to protect yourself. Forgiveness is not naive. It's not just saying, well, okay, it'll be fine. And no, it won't be fine. You need to take responsibility when you need to take responsibility. But in the final analysis, if you don't get your due in court, spiritually speaking, you leave it to God. Anybody half agree with that? Say amen. amen. Now, the second issue is you don't get an apology. Well, when somebody doesn't give you an apology, they like it. They like that you're stewing in your juice, whatever that means. <laughs> Carol's a great cook, and she makes pasta, I mean, a la pasta. And her sauce, like, cooks for all morning. So I go in there and dip some bread in it, but it bubbles all day long. It just is magnificent, right? And sometimes we get an injury, and it just, we stew all day long, and we can't get rid of it, and he doesn't call, and this is true in divorce and all kinds of things that break your heart. Remember that Jesus said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. You can put a Band-Aid over forgiveness like they did. What a clever little thing. Your people, your, your, your tech people are beyond belief. They're wonderful. But sometimes a Band-Aid doesn't help. And any salve of trying to justify the event to say, well, I suppose I participated with it. Don't get in bed with the patient. Be a doctor and analyze it. And you may not get an apology. How many people in the world have never given God an apology? He's waiting uh, to uh, welcome the, the apology because if there's no apology, there's no forgiveness. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the atheist and the blasphemer the people that love to do violence and wicked and whose feet walk on the blood of everybody else. That's a biblical phrase. They don't come to God. Don't you think that, that frustrates God? The Bible says he loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. It's because of the sin of the world his took, is now given and taken by Jesus Christ. So you don't get an apology. What do you do? We had a couple in our church, and they had a daughter who disappeared for about eight years. And uh, they finally got a call from the Boston police that a man had killed seven or eight, I forget the number, more than one is unspeakable, hacked these women and uh, buried them someplace. And that they thought in Boston that this couple sat on the second row. She looked like Barbara Bush. She was just a beautiful lady, that it was uh, their daughter one of these women that had been mutilated. And the deal was that he would tell them, just for the sake of preserving the remains of their precious daughter, where he buried the girl, if they would come up and sit with him and maybe offer forgiveness. So they agreed to do it. We counseled them. and Well, he never admitted it because a man who kills a lot of people doesn't feel it eventually and will forever be in the torture of God's judgment. But he just sat there, and he told them where the body was buried, and they brought the remains back to Charlotte and so on in the service that took place. And she said, I cried and sat there. I forgive you. She said, I forgive you because of Jesus. But he couldn't forgive. And he came home more angry than, than I could have imagined, and he swore and cursed at this man and said, you've taken away whatever. You can imagine how awful he felt when he realized how he had cut up the daughter's body, he could not forgive. He said, Pastor, I don't care what you preach. I will never forget it. I cannot forgive him. Six months later, he died of a stroke. He couldn't get over it. And I said, I can't tell you how I could identify with that. I can't. 
And I can't blame you for feeling that way, but until you let it go, how can I let it go? I said, I don't know. But I said, you offer forgiveness even though he doesn't give you an apology. And he said, where do you get that in the Bible? And I'd like you to turn to where you get that in the Bible. It's in 1 John chapter 2. When you don't get an apology, start by saying, does God get an apology? No. How can God, how can God say in his word that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? How can he say that? Did Jesus take away the sin of the whole world? Well, this passage will explain that. It says, if any man sin, we all do. We have an advocate with the Father. Did you ever look at the connection? God is the judge and the lawyer is his son. You got a good deal there. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is the righteous, who always says the right things, right? But then it says... He is the satisfaction. The word is propitiation. He is the satisfaction for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Potentially, all people are forgiven in the decision by God that his son would make sufficient offering to cover everybody, whosoever will. But the problem is, it's potential satisfaction, but not actual until the person says, I've sinned, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'll take your son, who's my substitute, who died for me and went to hell and rose again and has the keys of death and hell. I will accept your only begotten son as my substitute. I confess my sins before you, holy God. And the moment that happens, God releases me and becomes my satisfaction. Not potentially, but actual. Now, this is the same thing with people. With the person that offends you, potential forgiveness is there. I'm willing to make up. I, if you think I contributed, I'll get in bed with the patient. That's fine. I'll say I contributed. Whatever it takes to bring us to reconciliation. But you hurt me. And it feels bad. I'm hurt deeply. I'll never be able to forget it. You ruined my reputation. You killed my son because you had too much to drink. I mean, let's get real. This is a real thing. I feel it, and it's killing my wife. But the person doesn't take ownership. You gave potential forgiveness, but there wasn't any apology. So forgiveness hangs out there. And many times when the person doesn't give an apology, he loves it because he knows you're still hurting. It's a way of punishing you passively, because of his problem. Well, if you think I did that, well, okay, I'm sorry. That's not an apology. I didn't know I hurt you. That's a pitiful excuse of ignorance. The person knows. Well, if others think, and if that's what people say, I guess, maybe, I think, hopefully, yes, maybe, I don't know. I wasn't there, but if you say I was there, no. <laughs> The lady in the Food Channel did it right. She cried. And how you remembered, I said the N-word 10 years ago is beyond me. But the press has a way of holding stories until the right time. And she pleaded, I did it. I'm sorry. Did you ever have a problem like that? Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. But if the person doesn't say that, you don't get an apology Forgiveness is only half. It's offered. And if it's not received, you can't have fellowship with that person. If we confess our sins, we have fellowship with the Father and with Jesus Christ the righteous. If we say, you're crazy. It didn't happen that way. It's your fault. If you're facing a problem, you got the problem. I don't have the problem. If they do that, you call God a liar. And the other person is saying to you in your face, you're crazy. You're a liar. Didn't happen that way. I don't have to apologize. And you're stuck, right? Well, the Bible says only when two people come together and agree, the biblical word for covenant, there's no reconciliation. It's like today when you put your seatbelt in. Here's God. He's bringing it down. You have to be the receiver. You have to push it in. 
the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the reconciler. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, and he's given to us the word and the ministry of reconciliation. So he can reconcile all God wants and all he could do for every person, but until the other person becomes the receiver, there's no fellowship and forgiveness is only half. That's why with some people, you have to shake off the dust from your feet. Paul said about a couple of people in the church that got out of line, don't, don't even say God bless you to them. Have nothing to do with them. Treat them like they're pagans. Kick them out of the church, Paul says. If they don't recognize the elders and they don't say it publicly, then mention their name in the pulpit. They're excommunicated from the fellowship. Paul said of one man, I give him to the devil so the devil will kill him before he does more so that he might be in heaven. It's the fact that you don't get apology that burns you so badly. I suggest you recognize that fellowship is broken until the person repents and says, I'm sorry. You're going to live with the fact that you can't get along and you don't agree. Smile with your teeth. And in your heart, say, God, not my will, but thine be done. All right, let's deal with one other thing. The hurt doesn't go away. The pain is there. I can forgive, but I can't forget. Here's part of the answer to that. First of all, the depth of your hurt is measured by the weight of the offense. Uh, you lose uh, sunglasses, it's another thing. If you have a pair of sunglasses that are stolen, that's another thing. In one of the couples retreat that I was privileged to share in was at Lake Arrowhead. I guess that's the name of the place. I always tuck a couple hundred dollar bills in my wallet that Carol doesn't know about. <laughs> she knows now. But in the event there's an emergency, and I had a platinum American Express card that I've had since 1954. Right. Not gold. I covet a gold one. Or a black one. That's the card to have. But anyway, <laughs> when you travel, you need a little cash tucked away, and you need your American Express card, because you can borrow up to $10,000 if you're kind of like a senior member. My wallet was stolen out of the hotel at Lake Arrowhead. I had left it on the desk, which was dumb, my fault, right? But that was hard to forget. And I think of Lake Arrowhead, I'm not too happy about the fact. <laughs> because that is a memory, right? Things that happen to you happen because you caused it or somebody else caused it. And when somebody else causes it, that's the one that's hard to forget. Well, my mother has two girls and a third girl, but the doctor had been at a cocktail party. Delivered little Betty Ann, and two years later she died. Then they had me, which was a miracle, in that they dared to have another child. Because till the day my mother died at 54, she fell in the snow, I was a student at Wheaton. Every time I saw her, she would mention Betty Ann doctor went his way. My father was a lawyer. He decided not to sue. A doctor said to me this morning, he said, you know, I drink wine. But he said, I never drink wine before I do a surgical procedure. I said, thank God, sir. You should give up <laughs> wine altogether. But that happened. The person's dead. My father never brought it to suit. But my mother never forgot it. Never forgot it. Why should she? The wallet, that's nothing. A daughter, that's another thing. And the length of her hurt was based on the fact that she lost a child. No parent ever thinks their children are going to go to heaven before they do. And I had another story out there. In the second service where the husband and wife lost an adult child because of a medical procedure. It's their second marriage. The first marriage, the wife tells me, 
I lost a son with the same kind of medical problem. Not connected, no genes involved, just a mistake. Where, as we read once in a while in the paper, they cut off the wrong arm because it wasn't marked with a black marker or something like that. So the pain has nothing to do with forgiveness. You can forgive the person and you still feel it. Do you think God still feels the death of his son? Absolutely. The Bible says when we get to heaven, we will know Jesus by the nails in his hand. God puts up with stuff every day that's far beyond even the death of my sister or whatever problem. God comforts in sorrow. The Bible says the same comfort that God gives to us, he gives it to us for a ministry of comforting other people who equally have a heartbreak. You can't, you can't possibly comfort a person whose child was slaughtered or whatever. You can't. And sometimes it's just your presence, just being with them. When our little grandson was born, paralyzed from the waist down, and they brought him on a little pillow. We had a friend. And he came and sat at the hospital for two days. Didn't say a word. Didn't bring food. Just sat there. And I said, Robert, go home. He said, no. He said, I'm with you. Never gave me a scripture verse. I knew all the scripture verses. But sometimes the scripture verse has to be experienced when you look back on the situation and just the presence of a person to comfort and to be with. And that's exactly what Jesus is. Jesus said, I won't be here visibly to hold your hand and to cry with you. Although Jesus cried. But I will send the Holy Spirit who will be in you as well as being with you. He's called the Holy Spirit. Comforter. That means somebody who comes at the side and says, I know how you feel. When John the Baptist had his head cut off because a dizzy teenager danced half naked in front of him and he was half drunk or whatever and said, I'll give you anything you want. That's the greatest dance I've ever seen. She goes to her mother and her mother says, I hate John the Baptist. Get his head on a plate. And they went out and cut the head off John the Baptist, who was a cousin of Jesus, about whom Jesus said, Never was a man born of woman greater than John. When John was in prison, Jesus never visited him. When John was in prison, he was filled with doubt. He said to his disciples, The person you're talking about, is he the one or is another coming? Because he was in a dungeon of dark in the hills of Judea. He died alone. You and I have to remember we cannot be revengeful, even though we want to, and don't be afraid of feeling that way. Just identify with God who will take care of it. You don't get an apology. After a while, don't even expect it. It's like Jesus said to Peter, 70 times 7. I mean, by the time you add that up, you forgot the 52nd time, and you've got to start counting again. It meant that if he apologizes, forgive him. If he apologizes, forgive him. This isn't just forgetting people of something they don't admit. No, it was about forgiveness and admission. Well, by the 70th time seven happens, you just label the fellow, label the lady and say, get over it. It's going to be the same. They're not going to change. I'm not going to get an apology. That doesn't mean you swallow it, child of God. I'm not trying to lead you to that. But come to Christ. Come to the cross. And the disciples came to Jesus and said, they cut off the head of John the Baptist. And the Bible says Jesus went into a far place all alone. How did he feel? Such injustice. He could have called down the angels of heaven who are mighty warriors and crushed Herod and that wicked, wicked woman who took the head of John the Baptist on a plate and showed it. And they say the head of John the Baptist is in Damascus today. The church there claims that's where his head is. Some things are so bad and so terrible that in Christ's stead, the Bible says, in the place of Christ, here comes this injury, here comes this hurt, 
all right, stand in the place of Jesus. He's not here. And you face the situation. And even the problem of something that has died and you can't correct it, you, you, you come and you face it. You can curse it. You can nurse it. You can rehearse it and keep chewing on the same old problem. Or you can reverse it and say, as God forgave me, I forgive. Whether I get an apology or not, I want to be just like Jesus, who still is not recognized, who still is not appreciated. But in Christ's stead, I'm going to be reconciled to God. Ephesians 4.32. Be kindly affectionate one toward another, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Because if you sin against another Christian, you've sinned against Christ. He'll take charge of it. You don't have to take revenge. Stand up for your rights. Don't be abused. What's right is right. And if the apology isn't forthcoming and the pain remains, remember Nothing will ever be the same. I'm so glad my past is covered and things will never be the same because that same old, same old is bad. And this goodness and mercy that will follow me is from the hand of God. How to forgive? It's a lifelong struggle. If you're having trouble with it, just stand in Jesus' shoes and say, God, you forgive me all the time. What's the matter with me? I can forgive him. He won't admit it. I forgive him. God says, I'm dealing with that every day. With a world who will cross the line and the precipice and will tumble into the lake of fire. Do you think I, at that point, will forget them? Of course not. God will live for the fact that billions of people will be suffering forever. And a very small percentage will be in heaven with him. And we will all say, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He shall receive all the power and the glory forever because God is a forgiver. He forgave me. Paul says, you want to talk about sin? I'm the chief of sinners. Get in the back of the line. I'm number one. I hope that helped. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, as deep is our sorrow, as high is your love. We love you because you first loved us, Lord. We didn't take the initiative. You did. Condescendingly, you gave your Son, who bore our sins and sorrows, was crucified and nailed like a piece of paper to a light pole. He took it all for us. Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you for your Son. Now teach us. Help us. We're weak. We're so frail. We're made of dust. And we'll go back to dust. Teach us by your grace and mighty power to be the leverage in every relationship to forgive others as you continue to forgive us. And then the peace of God which passes all understanding and the ability to understand it completely will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. And while our heads are bowed, until I see you again, may I ask, if you're not a Christian and you haven't been forgiven, will you apologize to God and say, I'm not sure my sins are forgiven. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. How wonderful it is that God will forgive me. I'm a wretch. I deserve hell and the deserts of separation from him forever. But I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. I want to be God's child. I want to go to heaven. Here's my hand. Will you pray for me? Is there anyone in this beautiful room like that? Will you just lift your hand toward heaven and say, I need Christ. I need to be saved. Now, without any open invitation, we're not going to ask people to come forward. How many would just like to dump it this morning? I don't know your problem. You don't know mine. Mine may be heavier than yours. 
But as you sit here this morning, you'd like to sing that old child song, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away, the burden of my heart rolled away. John Wesley in Pilgrim's Progress, with that pack on his back, he walks and sees the cross on the hill of Calvary. And as he looks to the cross, the pack is severed by the love of Christ and rolls down the hill. Would you like God to lift that pack, that weight, that burden, that annoyance, that hurt from your heart and give you a peace that you've never really been able to appreciate because you won't let it go? Cancel the debt, let it go, and let God flood you with his grace and his love this morning. If anything like that relates to you, just lift your hand toward heaven and say, Ross, I need that in my life this morning. I understand it only partially, Ross, but I want to be relieved of that pain. I need to know the forgiveness that only God can bring. Any more with these? I'll not linger long. Yes, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Father, revive our work and our hearts in the midst of these days. Your coming is so imminent. If we knew how little time we had, would be on our faces on this rug this morning. Take away any stoniness in our hearts. Revive this blessed fellowship and teach us the truth of God in the depth of our heart. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. May I thank you for your love for me and for your love for the scripture. Your attention is almost disarming. Many times I'm teaching, kind of lose my train of thought because I see you listening so attentively and that's not because of me maybe you're looking for my mistakes that's the holy spirit <laughs> who is holding us through the scripture uh willie's going to sing a song and as he sings it the ushers will you please come forward